So when I had to kind of think about a topic for this, this evening, I was looking at different uh, things that I've been sharing lately about um, social housing and road widening and other sort of interesting topic. And I realized that what they all had in common was the 1930s. Every time someone was asking me a question about uh, a street that disappeared or changed, I, I realized that it was always to do with the 1930s. So I thought it's a good opportunity to try and, and package that entire decade in about 25 minutes. It's only 109 slides, so it should be okay. I'm not exaggerating, you'll see. And we're gonna do this chronologically, right? So we're gonna go from 1930, 31, 32, and um, first of all, the 1930s. Um, it was King George V, the top film was The Vagabond King, and also, as we're going to see, it was about the Housing Act in 1930 that had a real impact and a real um, transformative effect on the whole area. So the decade starts with a swimming bath. So the, the bar of Stirkington, people decided that people should have a place where they can swim. So they looked around and they thought, where can we build a swimming bath? Now, the site that was selected was in Clissold Road, where the leisure center is today, okay? And you can see that there were four grand houses called Glebe Place, and they decided to purchase the houses and construct a swimming bath in the back garden of those houses. Uh, these are photos of the construction. This is what the building looked like. Yeah, woo, swimming bath. Okay, very grand. Um, had the coat of arms of the bar at the top there. This was the interior. It looks great, but as I said in the past, people that actually went there just told me it was cold, it was damp, it was rusty, I hated going there. All right, so it's one of those things that probably looks nice in old photos, but if you were a child going there for swimming lessons, you probably hated it. I think the only relic is the coat of arms that's in the ground, in the lower ground floor that I showed in previous talk and this piece that's now in the Hackney Museum, okay? Could it be nice in the reception area, maybe, right, of the leisure center? So that's 1930, a swimming bath. 1931, this is the Manor House pub. Very nice pub, this is a photo from the 1920s or so. There was an interesting, massive sort of uh, tablet here saying, the Manor House, Queen Victoria halted here, 25th of October, 1843. Okay, if you're struggling to kind of place this and saying, where is that manor house? Yeah, mmm. And if you actually think, hold on, is that why it's called manor house tube station? Yes. Okay, the pub was actually rebuilt in 1931 when the tube station was being constructed. So they had to demolish the original pub from the 1820s. There's actually this tablet there as well. It says, you know, rebuilt 1931. On the, the side of the building, there's a very sad looking 1931. This is what it, the, the rebuilt pub looked like in its heyday. Okay, it was a very big pub. In the 60s, there used to be an evening upstairs, Bluesville, and some of the acts that would play there, Rolling Stones, The Who, Jimi Hendrix, and so on, Fleetwood Mac, and the list goes on and on and on, yeah. So that was the Manor House pub that was demolished to accommodate the new tube station. While we're talking about things that radically changed, people think that Stoke Newington is nice and picturesque now, but it used to be much nicer back in the day. Okay, this was Park Lane Bridge, a lovely bridge over the New River. This is Church Street and this is Cleasel Park in the background. Because today, the view is a bit different. So what happened with Park Lane Bridge? There was road widening of Park Lane, which we know now as Clissold Crescent, right? So you can see in this overlay, there used to be a bridge here. There was also Paradise Bridge just um, underneath Church Street. So the New River used to go all the way along Church Street, under Church Street, all the way down here, under Park Lane, and then where the allotments are, it used to continue southbound. All right, so then you got Petherton Road, Canonbury, all the way to Islington. Uh, next time you're in the area, if you go to the highly recommended New River Cafe for a set breakfast, have a look at the railings. There's li this little uh, plate. The Park Lane Bridge was demolished. The road widened June 1931. 
this was the view of the bridge from Church Street. So this is Cliss Old Crescent. This is Carrisford Road on this side. This is the New River Cafe. You can see, just look at the width of the road here. And today, that. It's exactly the same angle. So in the 1930s, we can see that some of those old picturesque village roads were completely transformed to accommodate the increase in traffic. You know, some, these days you get pavement widening, in the 1930s you got road widening. Because it's not just the, the milkman carriage and so on, and the cart, now you start getting more vehicles going through them. 1932, Manor House tube station uh, was completed and opened. Uh, there's a common misconception that Stoke Newington doesn't have a tube station. False, it does, okay? It's not in Church Street, it's not in the High Street, but it was definitely within the boundaries of the old borough and also the boundaries of the old parish, if you want to go all the way there, right? So this was our only uh, tube station. But this was actually not just a tube station. This construction was part of a whole public transport hub that not only included the tube station, but there was also quite an extensive uh, set of tram shelters on Seven Sisters Road. And you can see that it was all connected. So you could go from the tram all the way down to the station and vice versa, right? So it was about connecting the trams, the tube and the buses and creating this one hub. This used to be this amazing feature just outside Finsbury Park. So that was the tube station. Looking at another pub that was demolished in the 1930s, this was the old Rosen Crown. It was actually built on the site of an older Rosen Crown that was um, a timber structure. But this was actually on the opposite side of where you know the pub today. So this was early 19th century. The view today is this. Why did they demolish the pub? So the manor house was demolished because of the cheap station. The Rosen Crown was demolished because of road widening. The whole junction of Albion Road and Church Street was very narrow, very similar to what you saw in Park Lane. So they decided that they need to widen it. And as a result, the old pub that was here was demolished and the new pub was built opposite. And you can see with the dotted lines where the original pavement line was and where the new one is, which is the one we know today. This is a side-by-side -side comparison, just to show you the difference. So there was just a shop and a little house on the corner. These are the, the beautiful plans of the Rose and Crown, the new one, uh, by Truman Brewery's chief architect, um, Arthur Edward Tule. He designed 50 pubs for the brewery in the interwar years. Um, also the Red Lion on Church Street, also the Army and Navy, and about 47 others. This was the original site before the rebuild. There was a shop, and today. And there's a really nice photo that shows the old and the new Rosen Crown side by side. Because you think about it, the brewery probably said, we're not gonna demolish the old one unless we can open a new one, otherwise you lose a trade. So there was this sort of brief moment when the two kind of met. 1933. Stoke Newington was historically a very affluent place, very well-to-do, respectable area, but it also had very small pockets of poverty where you didn't have the big mansions and the big houses. You actually had very crowded, small, usually courtyards with tiny houses. And this is the Charles Booth poverty map uh, from the 1880s that color codes the poverty levels across London. And you can see that, you know, overall, you know, Stoke Newington, this is just a zoom in view, was fairly, you know, kind of comfortable, well to do, respectable, but there were these little pockets, dark blue color that signified poverty. And you can even see from the map as in a minute, those were very small houses. Now, the Housing Act of 1930 sought to address the, the poor living conditions of the working class in the country. So the idea was to provide local authority with funding to clear all those areas that were defined as a slum clearance area and then build modern housing on the site. So that was in the form of different financial incentive by the state. So local authorities like the Stoke Newington Borough Council can go in and demolish those old houses. We don't have many photos of what the, the old houses looked like, but just to give you an idea of just how small they were. This is Barn Street and this was the house. And the, the depth of it is pretty much the same as the length when you look on the map. So I really hope they were related. <laughs> These were some of the other slum clearance area, Rochester Place, Mason's Court, Leonard Place. 
Leonard Place is still off Ellen Road. It's now a nice little kind of gated development, but this is what it used to look like. And three others. All right, so you can see why they were designated slum clearance areas. Today, probably renovated and sold as a, as a little kind of charming one bedroom flat, but I think back then, they, they realized that in order to provide decent accommodation and good living standards, um, they had to intervene. Bear in mind that during World War I, 80% of people in the country were renting. Up until the 70s, a third of people were social tenants. So the view was that if you're gonna rent a property, instead of renting it from a private landlord, you might as well rent it from your local authority, pay a bit extra, but it's gonna be much, much better. You're gonna have a bath, you're gonna have a toilet, you're gonna to have hot water, you're gonna have a bit more space and green space and so on. So the first, I would say kind of 1930s local authority development was actually uh, something that became known as Lordship South Estate. Funnily enough, it wasn't actually on the site of a slum clearance, as we're gonna see. Um, this is the foundation stone. You got 1933, you got the name of the mayor. Have a look at the names of the architects, um, Howes and Jackman. They were the council um, architects, and they were very prolific from the 30s all the way to the 60s. These are all the developments. Probably they have more post-war developments as well. We move now to 1934, when Lordship South Estate began. So as I said, it wasn't actually built on the very small houses. So this is Bond Street. But on the opposite side, you had these semi-detached, really large houses with grand back gardens. Very, very ornate, very, very grand. And these were actually purchased and cleared to build the first 1930s social housing by the council. This is what Lordship Terrace used to look like. And this is what it looked like in 1934. Now, some of them were used to rehouse the people that used to live in the slums. Some of them uh, were on a, a waiting list and so on and so on. The perception of what later became known as council housing, social housing, affordable housing was very different in the 30s. Uh, back then, they were only referred to as dwellings for the working class or working class housing schemes. They weren't even referred to as council or social or affordable, anything like that. Um, it was purely just about providing better accommodation by the state through the local authority to the working class. This is what the housing scheme looked like at the end. You had Ormond House, Lordship House, and Clissold House. And Ormond House was named after one of the mayors that passed away the same year. I mean, this was a big deal. I mean, this was the opening ceremony. The Minister of Health came because providing decent housing for the working class was also a case of public health. There was a lot, a lot of philosophy and ethos behind it. It's very interesting to read about the founding principles of people that designed these housing schemes. A lot of them were highly influenced by the Garden City movement and the idea of providing green space with decent housing, people living in harmony with nature. Arts and crafts also played a huge role in influencing some of the architects. So these were very high quality homes with decent living spaces, separate bathroom, all those things that people that moved into them always said it was like winning the lottery. You know, it was climbing up the social ladder, going from a slum, a back-to-back -back house, into a really nice flat. In 1934, you know, the borough was coming of age. It was transforming from an old parish, an old village, into a proper municipal borough. Um, one of those things was also the change of the coat of arms. So this was the original uh, coat of arms. It wasn't actually an official one by the College of Coat of Arms. So you can see you've got the old church, you've got the trees, you know, there's, there's a whole kind of story behind it. But this was the new one that Stoke Newington got in 1934. Definitely, I think for me, kind of signifies that transition from the old parish into a proper London borough. You can see it in certain buildings like post-war estates, right? So it's still around us if you look up. Also, as part of that transformation of the borough, in 1934, there was a competition to design new municipal buildings. The old town hall was in Milton Grove on the corner of uh, Town Hall Approach, hence the name, Town Hall Approach. Um, so they had a contest and there were three submissions. One of them, by the way, this one, was by House and Jackman, the actual borough um, architects. They didn't win. The, the architect that did win 
was J. Reginald Trulov. Moving on to 1935. So they had the competition, now they had to build it. They had to find a place for it. The place that they decided was the most fitting for the new municipal building was in Church Street. They wanted to create a municipal hub next to the library, next to the substation in Edwards Lane, and they picked a site that was originally um, eight grand houses called Church Row. They were built in 1695 to 700 on the site of William Patton's Tudor Manor House. Okay, so there's quite a long history to that site. This is what Church Row looked like in 1935, as it was being dismantled, demolished, the pieces probably sold in auction. You can see this uh, foundation stone from 1935. Another interesting development, a housing development that took place in 1945 was not actually uh, by the local authority. This was a private housing estate. So Clissold Court, just next to Clissold Park, is a bit of an unusual private development. We're going to see that all the other housing developments were either um, by the local authority, whether it was the council, the London County Council, or the church commissioners. This was purely a private housing estate built on um, old nurseries. Um, it's a lovely development, very sort of art deco. Definitely recommend wandering in. 1936, or I said that the original Tudor house was on the site of where the town hall is today, and they were digging the foundation they actually found the basement and the original foundations of William Patton's manor house. So they found all these lovely bricks and decided rather than putting all of them in the skip, they incorporated them into what was originally the outer wall of the assembly hall. So you got a number of these groups that you can see. You can walk in from Church Street. There's uh, usually the, I think the main entrance is always open. You can wander in and have a look. Also in 1936, we get a new cinema as well. There were a few cinemas along the High Street and Stoke Newton Road. This was the Savoy, built in 1936. It's still there in a way. It was reopened a few years ago as an arts venue. Because it was closed for a very long time, some of the original features for when it was built are still present. So if you go there to see a show or something like that, look up because you're gonna see these beauties. In 1936, there was also, we're going to see an additional housing developments. This was Paradise House in Sturt Newton Church Street, just opposite Clissold Park. This was the childhood home of one Jonathan Hoare, who had Clissold House built in 1793. So this is where he grew up. And that's why he originally named the house Paradise House as well. So there were two Paradise Houses, not far from each other. It was originally residential, then it became a, a boys' school. They don't look too happy about being there, I must say. But like many of these old grand houses, by the 1930s, there was a need for housing. There was slum clearance. All these people had to rehouse somewhere. So this was the site of another housing development, Millington House, 61 flats. This one was not actually built by the local council. It was built by the London County Council. And you can tell which ones were built by the London County Council because they've got their coat of arms on all these developments. So the London County Council was also responsible for infrastructure around London, uh, transport, fire, housing as well. So they would also purchase land all over London and just build their own developments as well. So you could either be a, a social tenant with your local council or with the London County Council. This is kind of the evolution of London's local governance. I don't think they spent a lot of time designing the logo for this one, <laughs> as they probably did in the past. Not far from uh, where Paradise House stood, there were also these charming houses that I mentioned earlier. So this was the site of the swimming bath in 1930, but the council also decided to demolish these four semi-detached houses called Glebe Place and build um, housing on them. They actually ended up exchanging the land with the London County Council, which had land next to Lordship South Estate. So they effectively just did a swap because the London County Council wanted to build another housing project next to Millington House in the same area. And Stoke Newton Council wanted to build additional blocks next to the original one from 1934. So they just did exchange on the land. The site today looks like this. So this is Clissold Estate. Four houses by the 1930s made way for 70 flats. If you look up, you can see this. 
I don't think many people know that it was originally called Clissold Estate. I'm not sure that it's still referred to as such. And as I said, there was an exchange of the land and the local council then created an additional section. So you can see that in 1946, they kept adding to that original housing scheme in Lordship Terrace. So the remaining grand houses were also knocked down and then it became a larger housing development. Not everyone were happy about this, right? Uh, it was interesting to see that there was a petition by the people that lived in Queen Elizabeth Walk, you know, that very nice kind of quiet road that leads up to uh, Lordship Terrace. So this is a photo of what Queen Elizabeth Walk used to look like. Uh, these bollards were actually way further down than they are today, right? So they were all the way down here, and you can see that Lordship Terrace's gardens went all the way at the back. When they caught a whiff that there's gonna be a new housing development, uh, for the working class as well. They weren't too happy about that and they started a petition because according to them, one of the many issues it will create, we can visualize vendors of ice cream, toffee apples, peanuts, etc., taking their stand in the, in the walk. And this on Sunday afternoon, um, as now in Lordship Road. And consequently, the children using this exit in preference to the many other provided in the plans, the depreciation of the neighborhood as the residential area for quiet folk is already great. And only those who have to dwell here are best able to judge uh, of what was, what is, and what is going to be, exclamation mark. So not everyone was happy to see that the quiet streets were, in some cases, being affected or transformed by these housing schemes for the working class. You can see that the estate grew during the 60s and 70s. So this was the original 1930s development, but other areas and other streets next to it were developed over time. And we're gonna see that that was a common thread with all these developments. The nucleus was in the 30s, but then, there was also development usually in the 60s and 70s as part of urban redevelopment. Also in 1936, we got a filtration plant um, just by the West Reservoir. This is what it used to look like originally. This is the view from inside. There used to be two ponds outside. And this is the view today. In 1947, there was a lot of change in Stoke Newington, like I said. New coat of arms, you get a new town hall, you've got all these housing developments popping up and so on. And just to make things even more interesting, there was a decision across London by the London County Council to rename duplicate streets across the whole city. Because a lot of those streets dated back from old ancient times. Every parish had a, a high street and a church street and a park lane and a park crescent. There was a lot of subsidiary naming as well. So a developer that would build four houses would just name them, you know, Nick's Court or Richard's Place. So they want to get rid of that. Um, so this is the list of all the street names in Stoke Newington in the borough in 1935. And I just highlighted all the ones that were renamed or absorbed into other streets, usually Church Street or High Street. There are still some traces of those old names. So for example, next time you go down Albion Road, Barbold Road, have a look. It used to be called Broughton Road. Okay. And there's also a very rare pre-1917 N postcode on it. But it was probably painted black when the street was renamed rather than remove it. But it's still there, a relic of the old name. Uh, next time you go down Beatty Road, if you look up, there's a relic of an old painted sign, Gordon Road. That was the original name. So there's still some echoes of what those names were. Back to housing. So we talked about uh, developments by the local council, by the London County Council, and another body that was building all these new housing developments, uh, primarily for the working class, were also the church commissioners, right? So this was the Denman House development in Lordship Terrace. Okay, so the, the church commissioners had a long history of building charitable housing, whether it was Elms houses for elderly and people that couldn't afford, um, otherwise, so they also had their own housing developments in the area. They actually own, or used to own, most of the land north of Church Street. So they decided to address the slum clearance area in Barn Street, Lordship Terrace, and Lordship Road. So this is what Barn Street used to look like. You can see at the end, kind of the Lordship South Estate development, so this is Ormond House. But these were all the very small, dilapidated, 
houses of Barn Street, definitely no toilet, no bath, no hot water. And people used to live there, usually you know, big families as well. So for them to move out and go into better conditions was definitely preferred. This was Lordship Terrace. These were the houses opposite the big ones where the, the Lordship South Estate was built. And this was Lordship Road. So this is kind of the old watch house, you know, the triangle, if you go to the Red Lion. This is what those houses used to look like. And this is what they built in the site, Denman House. Looking at some of the photos when the estate was built, there used to be a greengrocer on the corner. It's now a flat. But again, you can see just in terms of the, the quality of housing when it was built, and a lot of pride, both by the architects and the people that moved in. There was very kind of strict rules. You know, there were caretakers, and you would get like a, a, a quite thick booklet about what you can do in the flat and what days you can put your washing out. Kids cannot make a sound between this and that, and you can't play on the grass, and if you do, you get chased. But that was the way that they kept it in check. Uh, unfortunately, there was neglect later on in history and uh, in terms of the reputation and even the condition of a lot of those developments that had all these aspirations and all these ideals, they, in some cases, definitely became run down. This is what Lordship Terrace looked like in 1947, completely different. You know, on this side, you had those large houses with the big gardens. On this side opposite, you used to have the small houses of Barn Street and, and Lordship Terrace as well. By 1937, it was all what we would define today as social housing. And also the town hall was completed after two years. Some views of the inside when it opened. This is another view of what it looks like today. These are some photos I took a few years ago of some of the remnants. This is an unused space, as far as I'm aware, that faces Church Street, that lovely curved section. And we're almost finishing a couple of minutes. So 1938, probably the most exciting thing that happened in 1938, the 649 trolley bus replaced the 49 tram. I think this is our last housing development for the evening, further down south, not far from us, by the way. This was the Hewling Street housing scheme. Very small courtyards with tiny houses just next to uh, Matthias Road. That area was also cleared, and a new housing development was built there. It was referred to as the Hewling Street housing scheme. There's a surviving foundation stone that you can see in Matthias Road. This is the result. And this is what it looked like. So three blocks. And like Lordship South Estate and how it grew and grew and grew, this is now the Millington Garden Estate. This is a, a massive complex. And it's really interesting when you go in and you can see the different developments from the different eras. The original houses from the 1930s are all the way down here. But then you've got all these additional developments from the 1960s and the 1970s. Another development that was in the works in the 30s was Woodbury Down Estate by the London County Council. They wanted to get rid of all these grand houses just north of the reservoirs. Woodbury Down was a very thinly populated area, very posh, big, big houses, a lot of trees, a lot of all these village roads. And the London County Council bought all of them and wanted to build its most ambitious housing development on the site, 57 blocks on the side of Woodbury Down. This is what Woodbury Down used to look like. The development was delayed because of the Second World War, even though it was designated for clearing, and this is what it looks or looked like in the, the 50s. Uh, as I mentioned, not everyone was always happy about these kind of developments for various reasons. These are two news articles that give you the range of opinions. On one hand, you've got Woodbury Down, the state of the future, you know, this new town, um, and, you know, a lot of promise, a lot of optimism. Uh, it included schools and shops and, and, and library. It was a whole little neighborhood that was built to accommodate a lot of people. But then he also had this, one million slum dwellers paradise. Okay, and I'll just focus on this one quote. So it refers to this photo here of this man just overlooking the reservoir. You've got the filtration plant. And it says, uh, when on the edge of this lake from which the people of North London get their water, towering flats rise up, hundreds of shouting children will take the place of this solitary silent man. 
Not everyone was very keen on these blocks popping up and, and kind of obscuring the view and creating a lot of noise from children, apparently. And finishing, you know, the decade saw so much development and so much optimism. And as we all know, it came to a halt in 1939. Um, just a few little bits, just to conclude. So this was the first publication of the Stoke Newington Air Raid uh, Precautions booklet. Okay. So you can see that on the kind of the eve and even kind of during kind of 1939, everything came to a halt, all those housing developments, a lot of other things that were planned. The very new town hall that was only opened in 1937, shiny and white, looked quite different. It became the, the Civil Defense Control Center and as such was camouflaged. And I'll just finish with this one little kind of um, item that I found in one of the booklets. So this talks about how in 1939, the library provided a range of activities beyond loan of books. In 1939, a local history exhibition took place reflecting the public interest in the rich history of the area. And I'm very happy to say that that interest is still alive today. So thank you very much.